Hello, Terrier alumni, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Reframing Stress, a Toolkit for Excelling in the Workplace. My name is Jeff Murphy, and I'm an Associate Director in the BU Alumni Relations Office, as well as a proud alumnus of the BU Questrom School of Business. Today's webinar is being sponsored by the BU Alumni Association and is offered to our 321,000 alumni around the globe. Throughout your career, the Alumni Association is committed to helping you define and achieve your professional goals. We aim to do this by providing alumni with access to a series of valuable online tools and social media communities. It's important that we get your opinion on how we're doing, so we very much look forward to receiving your feedback via a survey that will be emailed to all of you later today. I know we have alumni joining us uh, from places like Sri Lanka, Korea, Israel, Jupiter, Florida, Londonderry, New Hampshire, Laredo, Texas, Bethesda, Maryland, and as always, of course, dozens of Massachusetts alumni from towns like Weymouth, Gloucester, Pepperell, Lynn, and more. For each and every one of you out there, please know that we really do value your opinion on this and every program that we offer. Before I introduce today's speaker, I have some brief housekeeping notes. As you know by now, this webinar is being hosted on the Adobe Connect online meeting platform. If you experience any trouble with the audio or visual portions of today's presentation, I'll ask that you please contact Adobe Connect directly. And if you want to grab a pencil or a pen, I can give you a phone number to call. You'll want to reach Adobe Connect at 1-800-422-3623. Today's presentation is being recorded and will soon be made available for on-demand viewing on the Alumni Association website found at www.bu.edu slash alumni. Our speaker today is very eager to answer any questions that you may have and you're welcome to submit them throughout the presentation using the Q&A chat box you should see at the bottom of your screen. We hope to get to as many questions as we can. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for the day. Presenting from all the way out in sunny Venice, California is CGS and COM alumna Brady Hahn. Brady is a facilitator, strategist, and experienced designer in the leadership development space. Her passion is helping people build connections through story. Her work includes facilitating sponsorships and curating content for 200 plus activations, reaching over 100,000 professionals at conferences, networking events, and executive trainings across the US, Europe, and Asia. As the founder of Insight Collective, she works with organizations to harness internal knowledge and talents to generate sustainable ideas and craft meaningful content, products, and services. In addition, Insight hosts out-of-office gatherings and retreats to nurture leaders and connect them to the ideas, people, and tools they need to better serve their communities. Brady has been featured on Inc.com, EscapeTheCity.org, RYOT News, Eventbrite.com, and socialmediaweek.org, just to name a few. Uh, Brady, I'm guessing that's actually Riot News now that I'm reading it back to myself. Sorry about that. Uh, she's also been featured in two books, including fellow BU alumna Porter Gale's Your Network is Your Net Worth, which was published in 2013, and Professor Robert Schock's Pyramid Quest, published in 2005. A student of meditation for over 20 years, Brady is a certified facilitator of counsel, uh, Reiki master, and Atma Yoga teacher. Uh, Brady, I, I think you're very well qualified to help lead us through some uh, tips about how to reframe stress in the workplace. Thank you so much for being with us today. The floor is all yours. I'm going to go ahead and get your slide deck up and running on our screen here, uh, and then you can just go ahead and take it away. Great. So the presentation is just coming up for me, so I'll give it just a second. Thanks so much for that lovely introduction. I really appreciate it. And I'm Thrilled to be here with all of you this morning. Um, and hopefully we can share some of our own experiences um, and tips and tricks in dealing with reframing stress. So um, just to kick things off, kind of a quick overview of what we'll be covering today is, of course, the big question, what is stress? How do we understand what our common triggers are? I'll give you a little bit on some of the latest research that I've found. You should know that I love reading and I love research. Um, and so I'm always interested in finding new kinds of articles and you'll be, be provided with a lot of reading um, at the end of this as well. And um, I'm also really interested in looking at how we reframe stress. And I chose the word reframe because I think that we often try and like quote unquote deal with things. And dealing with things isn't always easy. And sometimes it's just a matter of changing our perspective and changing the way we think about things in really small increments that actually can have a profound effect in a, in a big ripple effect in a much larger way on how we are actually able to physiologically 
change our bodies and our minds. So I've got five kind of really simple, easy solutions. Hopefully some of them are new to you, um, or at least a reminder of tools that you can utilize throughout the regular workday. And then of course, we're gonna have lots of resources as well and further reading for you guys to take with you. There will also be an email at the end of this um, with all of those resources that you can take away. So to get started, I'm gonna start with a little bit of a story. I have been doing events over the last eight years, uh, actually all across the United States, Europe, and Asia. And what I found is that commonly asked on most panels or fireside chats um, or during any kind of speaking event was this question that kept coming up of what keeps you up at night? And initially, I just kind of thought it was like a super fun question of like, oh, you know, what are the things that people are thinking about that when they're like going to bed at night, especially executives and CEOs from major global companies, you know, they always had kind of funny answers, things like, oh, you know, the usual, did I forget to send that email? Did that project actually get delivered? Are we going to finish on time? Um, or lovely things about their families and their wants and dreams for their children. But what I realized is that the response to this question or just even the asking of this question itself is extremely important. And I think it's because what really it gets to is what keeps you up at night is both talking about the actual act of not being able to sleep because something is stressing you out and also the, the, just the fact that everyone had an answer to this question. I've never had a speaker on stage say, actually nothing keeps me up at night, I sleep extremely soundly. And I think that speaks to something deep within our culture um, as working people and also really speaks to the fact that we have one really common experience and unfortunately that's stress. So why have a whole conversation about stress? And hopefully we have a positive one today about it. Um, and I wanted to start with just the idea of what is stress and understanding what it means. And in my experience, stress is kind of like a leak in your roof, but the kind of leak that leaks through the walls, not the one that drips in the middle of the room that you can put a bucket under and collect all of the water until the plumber comes. It's the kind of leak that drips down the wall that slowly starts to create mold and corrode not only the integrity of the wall, but the integrity of your roof and the integrity of your entire house. So if that leak is really like a metaphor for our bodies, imagine what stress does over time. If you're constantly in a state of stress, chances are you're doing a lot of damage to not only your body and your mind, but also the relationships that you have with yourself and others in your life. So if you guys want to, we have a couple poll questions over on the side. Um, and so the first one is, which option fits you best? I'm constantly stressed. I feel stressed from time to time, or I rarely feel stressed. You can also choose not to vote, but feel free to take a vote. And then when your answers come in, um, we'll report back to those and take a little look. <laughs> that was really fast. I'm constantly stressed and <laughs> seem to bounce up first. And the reason I ask this question is because we all know that we experience stress as a culture and as a society. It's one of those things that um, I think is a constant for most of us. And I'm glad to see that it's, we're kind of in the middle road, feeling stressed from time to time. But one of the things that's most important about stress is that being stressed out actually costs us a lot of valuable time and energy. And we'll talk a little bit more about um, both physically how that happens and also mentally. So I just made a list of some of the things that I think are common triggers for people, like commuting to and from work, project deadlines, unpleasant coworkers, feeling socially disconnected from your family or your coworkers, maybe just not identifying with them on a fundamental level, feeling unsure about your work or what needs to be done, planning and taking vacation time, receiving a review or feedback on performance, seeking a promotion, layoffs at a company especially are extremely stressful even if you know you're keeping your job, bringing on new hires, and probably many more things. And so those things can bounce us into states of stress and out of it. And I love this definition because I think it's so simple and really easy, is that stress is something in your environment that you're trying to avoid, but that you have not yet avoided successfully. I'm just gonna repeat that one more time. Stress is something in your environment that you're trying to avoid, 
but that you have not yet avoided successfully. The reason I like this definition from Art Markman, who's a PhD scientist, he wrote this article um, in Harvard Business Review, is because it actually means that we have a choice. If stress originates in our minds, and then we have a physiological response to it, we actually have the ability to choose how we want to deal with it. It's kind of like having uh, debt on your credit card. When the bill comes, you have a choice to make a payment or to let it roll over to the next month. Neither one is necessarily good or bad. It's just a choice, right? Um, but, you know, eventually, if you keep ignoring the credit card bills and not making payments, you're going to accumulate a lot of debt. In this case, you'd accumulate a lot of stress. And the way that that stress weighs on your credit, or at least in this case, the debt weighs on your credit and other things, is going to have a longer term impact. But you also have a choice. You can make a payment. You can call your creditors and say, hey, I'd like help in making these payments. You know, you've got a lot of different ways that you can start to relieve the financial pressure that you're putting on your credit card. In the same way, you can start to relieve the stress that you're putting on your system. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the physiology of stress because I actually think it's extremely interesting the way stress physically manifests itself in the body. So what it comes from is our evolution from animals. As humans, we have, you know, this fight or flight response. And that is literally our survival instinct. It's something that starts in our amygdala and literally runs down our spine and into the kidneys, which then releases a whole bunch of different hormones. So more specifically, when we feel threatened in any kind of way, when something puts stress on our system, our atomic nervous system, which regulates our heart rate, our digestion, our respiratory rates, um, our pulsatory responses, this system is like our, it's our mechanics. It's like what actually makes our body run. And within that, we have our sympathetic nervous system. And this is like actually what reacts to some kind of threat and releases hormones like neuropeptorine and epinephrine and other hormones like estrogen, to testosterone, cortisol, and our neurotransmitters like dopamine and serotonin, which affect our entire ability to be a normal human being and function. And this then like puts a reaction into our, what, well, this reaction then can take place and continues over time if we're constantly stressed. So people who feel stressed from time to time, you might notice that during stressful periods, maybe you don't sleep as well at night. Or maybe you find that your mind is running more or that you're more spaced out. Like, have you ever noticed that you have an entire week where you put your keys in the freezer or you forget to close your front door when you leave the house to go to work? Or maybe you put your coffee on top of your car and drive away with it there. Those are all signs that you're actually stressed out being spacey is a really simple indication that your body is running its mechanics in an incorrect way. And then in the times when maybe you're not feeling so stressed, that's when your parasympathetic nervous system takes over. It's what allows you to rest and digest. So if you have any digestion issues, chances are that part of the system isn't working because maybe you're pumping too much cortisol through your system. The rest and digest is extremely important because it's what allows us to recover. It's the part of our bodies that says like, I am safe, I'm okay, like in the most literal kind of animalistic sense, but it's also the part of our bodies that allows us to literally heal ourselves and, and heal our minds and allow our bodies like a chance to rest. So it's extremely important. And what I like about James Hamblin's like kind of short version of what I just gave you is that basically the stress response is facilitated by the adrenal glands and those sit on top of your kidneys, which is really interesting because the kidneys are so tiny, but do a lot to actually keep our bodies functioning properly. And when they're pump, when that adrenaline comes pumping through your adrenal glands,
Hey, everybody. I think we might have lost Brady there for a second. Brady, if you can hear me, um, you might try maybe unplugging your microphone and plugging it back in because we're not hearing you at all right now. Brady, are you able to, um, I just put up a chat box here. Um, yeah, uh, folks, I'm going to put everybody on standby for just one second. I really apologize for this, um, but with Brady all the way over on the other side of the country, it seems our connection wasn't so good. Um, I am going to uh, just put you in a, a hold for a second, and uh, I'll, I'll let you know where we are in just a minute. So thanks for your patience while we try to get this back up and running. Hey Brady, can, can you hear me? I got you. Yeah. All right. Great. Sorry about that. Um, I'm gonna bring everybody back in from We're the meet. Back. The, yeah. Hang on one second. Sure. Okay, everybody. Sorry about that. I think we've got Brady back on the line. Uh, Brady, I'm sorry for the interruption, but uh, please go ahead and continue. Well, speaking of stress. <laughs> it's uh, one of those moments when, when technology doesn't work. It's a total test. Um, so anyways, what I was saying is that uh, most of the time our stress responses are operating as a background hum. I love that quote. Uh, stress as a background hum I think is really true, especially in our culture. And it's extremely hard to turn off and actually be able to relax. And true relaxation is a really beautiful thing and something that we probably don't experience as often as we should or could. So that's one of the things that hopefully we'll get to cover today are little ways that we can manage stress in the moment, but then also find those blissful periods where the hum goes quiet and where we're able to actually recover and relax. So in reframing stress, here are five simple solutions that I've come up with. Um, number one is identifying your triggers. This might sound super simple and it actually is. It's about taking note of when you feel stressed and how it makes you feel. Because this allows you to gain control over your response. Because if we, as we know, stress starts in the brain, in the amygdala. So if we're able to say, hey, I see you, I hear you, before it goes all the way down to your adrenal glands, just above those kidneys there, you actually have a chance to stop the hum before it even starts. So it's asking some simple questions in the moment. Like maybe right now it's saying to yourself, what creates my stress? Or like maybe pick three things that you know really stress you out. And that might be something as simple as like getting, getting into my car to go to work in the morning stresses me out because I know the drive is going to be challenging. Living in LA, we deal with tons of traffic and it's actually extremely stressful. Believe it or not, we're not at the beach all day in our bathing suits and flip-flops. So the other question you can ask yourself is like, where does my stress go? Where does my stress go? That question means, what, where does my head go? Maybe it like causes me to unravel and start asking tons of questions in my brain or thinking all sorts of things that could or could not happen into the future. Or maybe your stress goes somewhere in your body. Oftentimes people will say, 
I notice when I'm stressed, I get back pain or neck pain, or maybe there's like one little point in your knee that really starts to ache. Those are signs that you're physically experiencing stress and understanding where it goes is important because it allows you to say, oh, hey, I'm, that must be stress. That's why my knee is hurting, right? So this is all about gaining control or at least like some sense of awareness around what's happening mentally and physically. Also, another way to ask the question is when I get stressed, I, and completing that sentence. For example, when I get stressed, I start overthinking. I can't sit down and focus on one thing. I get fidgety and I feel like I can't focus. That's a perfectly logical answer. Or when I get stressed, I have difficulty communicating clearly with other people around me. Any, whatever the answer is to you, it's important to just understand where your stress goes and how you react to it. And so the last question being, what is one reaction that will decrease my stress? So, okay, if I have the opportunity to create a different response or a different reaction when I experience stress, like for instance, someone cutting me off in traffic, instead of swearing profusely at them, I could say, you know what? Okay, pause, take a deep breath and create a different kind of reaction so that the stress leaves my body, leaves my mind. But we'll talk a little bit more about that here. So two, pause. When you get triggered, can you take a pause? That means just like one deep breath because oxygen literally is what bring, bringing it through your body, through your breath, is what helps clear your brain. This is why in yoga, we spend a lot of time learning how to breathe. Or in Pilates, for instance, you also spend time learning to breathe. Or if you're a weightlifter at the gym, have you ever noticed that in all of those scenarios, you're reminded to breathe? And you're giving a specific pattern on how to breathe based on the exercises that you're doing. And there's a reason for that. One, you'll faint if you're holding your breath while trying to work out. But it's also true that you'll faint while trying to hold your breath at any point in life. So breathing is a really actually key component to learning how to release stress from your body. Because when you're, for instance, running or afraid, the first thing you do is hold your breath, whether you realize it or not. So one really simple calming effect, and you guys can do it with me right now if you want, is just to close your eyes and gently take three deep breaths in and out. And even if you only have time to just take one breath, you can do this in a meeting, you can do this in your car, you can do this standing in line at the grocery store, you re it's not something that's that noticeable, but the effect of it is extremely profound and helpful. Some other ways to find pause are earthing. Earthing is literally like getting out and putting your bare feet on the ground. Or maybe it's going outside and having lunch and being able to sit on the ground. The idea of earthing is actually um, shown that the electromagnetic energy of the planet actually allows us to what we would call ground and connect. So it's, it has an extreme calming effect. And if you can't get outside during the day, another way of achieving that is actually looking at a picture of nature or something that you love that allows you to actually feel calm and connected. So that's like a really easy one. And also just getting outside and breathing fresh air that's not like the circulated air in your offices is extremely helpful, especially to get good sunlight. After living in Boston for six years, I have to tell you the value of getting outside, even when the weather is really crummy, is extremely helpful because um, we spend so much time indoors, especially through the winter. Meditation is another option to find pause, but this isn't always easy for everyone. Um, there are some great apps out there like Headspace, which I have the reference in the uh, end of the presentation so you can look at it. And it's an app that you can actually listen to meditations of different lengths and they have all different kinds of focuses, anything from health and wellness to meditations for kids. Um, and the idea of meditating, I think there's a lot of 
misconceptions about what meditation is and isn't, but ultimately even just the three breath exercise is a meditation in and of itself. Um, you know, or closing your eyes for three to five minutes and just breathing is enough of a meditation. And of course, if you want to take that deeper, there are lots of different resources for it if you don't have a practice already. But of course, in the middle of a meeting, sometimes it's hard to take a meditation break. So that's where the three breaths becomes really helpful. The other one is to move, like literally getting up and moving your body. If you, let's say you get an email that comes into your inbox that's just obnoxious and upsetting, literally standing up out of your chair is one way to physically change your environment. It allows you to breathe. It actually allows you to like shake it off in the most literal sense. And it like actually counterbalance. I love this because it's this quote that says, do something that makes you sweat physically. It counterbalances the metaphorical sweat. I think oftentimes when we feel stressed, we end up working more hours um, or spending more time doing things that don't de-stress us. Like maybe you get home and decide to clean the entire house. I find cleaning really stress relieving, um, but oftentimes when I do it in a state of stress, I do it in a way that's not helpful for my energy or for my body. So the idea of getting out and going to a yoga class, going to the gym, going for a run, all of those things actually like get you breathing and get you moving. Um, and that's gonna help you actually get to that state of rest and digest, right? Because after a workout, chances are you're gonna be really hungry and tired. And so those things are super helpful. Um, another way to get moving, this is actually one of my favorite tips to give people, is to drink more water throughout the day. Water like actually gives you a huge energy boost. Um, obviously not the kind that coffee does, but it hydrates your body. It also will force you to go to the bathroom more throughout the day, which will keep you in more of a constant state of motion. And this one's actually kind of funny because I was talking with a friend about it um, who works for a very large global company, and she asked for any word of advice on her first day of work. And the hiring manager said, don't drink too much water because we're constantly in meetings and you won't have time to go to the bathroom. And I was like, that's probably one of the most terrifying pieces of advice I've ever heard from a company because literally they're saying you're under so much stress, you don't have time to go to the bathroom. Um, which now she laughs about because it's true. She doesn't have a lot of time, but she continues to drink a lot of water and make the time for it, which is really important. Also, wearing a Fitbit can be super helpful because you can track your steps and you'll know how much you are or are not moving. And I think the big one thing I hear most from people who are wearing Fitbits or using their iPhone step counter is that they actually realize they're not doing as much walking as they think throughout the day. So if they skip the workout, not just once, but twice or three times a week, they're actually missing out on a lot of potential exercise and good doing for their bodies. I would also say set a reminder to move. Um, sometimes it's really helpful to time yourself. Like maybe you set a half an hour to respond to emails. And at the end of that timer, you get up and do something, whether it's go and grab a glass of water or maybe just take a stroll around the floor of your office building. Another great option is something like Desk Yogi, which actually sends out daily reminders to you and then gives you a link to different kinds of yoga exercises that you can do in your office, in office clothing, which is super helpful. Um, and there's all different kinds of great stretches and sequences that you can utilize there. And the nice thing about also setting a timer is that you'll start to learn how long it takes you to do different kinds of tasks. And that actually gives you more space and more room in your day and actually decreases stress because you understand then how to schedule your day in a more effective way. Okay, so number four, recover with play. So this one sounds kind of funny, but I think especially as adults, we forget sometimes how important play is. And play isn't just like getting on and doing a video game or something like that. Play is actually more about experiencing spontaneous joy. Because what you do out of work, and even what you do in work during office time, is really important. But especially out of work, it's that space where you get recovery. 
And I like this, recovery from work is defined as the process by which a person's functioning returns to pre-stressor levels and work-related strain is reduced. Whew, that's a big one. So if this is like our rest and digest stage, how are you utilizing it to the best of your ability? You know, whether you're reading books, um, one I highly recommend is The Passion Plan by Richard Chang. Um, it's a, it basically talks about like how to be able to pursue your passions, uh, whether or not you have a job that you're passionate about. And I think that that's important because we all need to work and we all need to pay bills and support our families financially. And not every job allows for us to pursue our passion on a day-to-day -day basis. And this book has some really good tips and advice on how you can actually incorporate your passions in all different kinds of ways, both inside and out of work. So I highly recommend reading it. Um, also, you can try things like an adult coloring book. Um, and and there, this is like very popular right now. Um, just start coloring, get colored pencils and pens and those kinds of things. And it's actually extremely meditative to color too. Um, and quite fun. And it sounds super cheesy. And I actually got for Christmas, everyone in my family got a coloring book and thought I was nuts. All of them use it on a regular basis and really enjoy it. Um, and so, you know, try something different. Or you can also go to a museum where just looking at art and different kinds of things, whether or not you, you know, think the art is fabulous, it's actually just the fact that you're getting up, you're walking around, and you're changing your environment and doing something that feeds your brain in a completely different way. You know, another great thing could be taking a road trip if you like driving. Getting in the car and, you know, going somewhere new can feel really good. I think also things like joining the sports team is really helpful, um, you know, whether it's kickball or softball. Uh, being a part of a team is extremely valuable, especially when it's people who are outside of your work environment. Um, you have a chance to like really decompress. I know my mom just started doing tango lessons and loves it because she's found an entirely new community around a common interest that she never would have expected to enjoy so much. And it also allows her to get exercise and use her body and brain in a completely different way. So play is an extremely important part um, of being able to reduce stress, but also like what gets us to number five, which is changing our minds about the stressors that are around us. And this idea of like design thinking, I think is really interesting. And it's a way of reframing the way you look at the world and deal with issues. And the main thing is the idea of empathy. So empathy is often a heavy term for a lot of people. And something that I think we naturally as human beings tend towards is this empathetic response. It's maybe something that as we get older and more beaten down by things, it feels harder. But in actuality, I think our first response is always the empathetic one, whether or not we realize it. So it's this idea of like maybe refraining the morning commute. Like, for example, when someone cuts you off again, you know, all you have to say is everyone needs the same thing as me to get to work. I'm lucky to have a job and a way to get there. Like, just imagine if you said that mantra to yourself the entire way to work. Would you feel calmer? Would you feel different about how the actual process is going? Or if you're in a meeting, if you have a meeting and a pending deadline, you could say, you know, a clear deadline allows me to organize my tasks and clarify what I need for my team. I'm motivated to see how much I can achieve in the time period I have. Like again, reframing what a deadline means and how you can meet it actually can make it motivational instead of like soul crushing. Dealing with a difficult colleague. This one I think is probably the most challenging. Like when you have someone that pushes your buttons constantly and they're at the desk next to you and maybe they talk too loud on the phone or whatever it is that triggers you. You know, reframing it to say work is just one part of my life. I'm grateful I have the tools to deal with this person. I actually had a panel just a couple weeks ago with a dynamite group of um, senior level professional women and one of them mentioned how she has a colleague that just if you know if she says the sky is blue 
um, you know, she'll say, no, it's brown kind of thing where they just can't agree on anything. And it was a couple months into this job where another colleague said, you know, my heart just really goes out to this difficult colleague. She really just doesn't enjoy this job and is really struggling to make it feel good for her. And this, and this woman said, you know, actually that changes everything on my perspective about this person. She's like, knowing that she was having a hard time and that, you know, she was really struggling as a person gave her empathy for the fact that like, you know, in meetings, she would always constantly battle because she was trying to save her job and save her place. And like, we all want that for ourselves. And so this idea of empathy can translate into a lot of different ways. But I think the one that I actually don't have on this slide and wish I would have included was also being empathetic for yourself. We are often our worst critics and that we, I think, put the most pressure on ourselves to perform well, to, you know, support our families and support everyone in our lives. And at the end of the day, we have to be empathetic for ourselves, especially when we're feeling stressed. And instead of beating ourselves up about, oh, I should have responded differently for that, it's saying, yeah, I should have responded differently for that. And now I know next time that I can do better. You now it's keeping it simple. So just as like a quick review, we have number one, identify those triggers. Take note of what makes you feel stressed and how it makes you feel. And ask yourself questions like, where does my stress go? When I get stressed, I. What is one action that will decrease my stress? Number two, don't forget to pause. When you feel triggered by stress, take at least one deep breath. And that's as simple as closing your eyes, breathing in, and breathing out move. So again, this one is like when you feel stressed, you can pause and then move or move and then pause, whatever seems to work for you. But again, my favorite tip for this one is drinking more water throughout the day so that you're actually forced to stand up from your desk and move. It will actually, most people tend to feel stressed towards the end of the work day and this will really help with that. Number four, Recover with play. So whether that's, actually you guys can hit the number two question on here, which is how would you finish this sentence? To de-stress I, do something relaxing, like read a book, I talk to a friend or a professional, I do something physical, I plan a vacation, or I deal with it in the moment. And I'm sure there are many more ways to deal with stress. Just try to pick some various categories. But this idea of play, remember, is like sometimes it's just going to someone that makes you laugh and asking them to tell you something funny. You know, play can be really simple and doesn't have to take a lot of time or a lot of your energy. And sometimes it's watching just a silly cat video on YouTube if that makes you feel good. So let's see. So far, it looks like doing something physical is people's favorite way to de-stress with second place coming in, reading a book, or doing something relaxing, which is great. I'd also recommend like reaching out to professionals for things like massages or Reiki. Um, that can also be super helpful in recovering kind of physically and emotionally from stressful situations. And number five, change your mind. So this is kind of the one that I think will take the, it takes the most time for sure, because it's about not only recognizing the trigger, taking the pause, you know, shaking it off, but then saying, okay, what would be the empathetic response to this situation? So, you know, again, I think it's going back to that morning commute. Everybody needs the same thing as me to get to work. I'm lucky to have a job and a way to get there. So this is like just kind of my favorite reminder. And Allie Hamilton is a really talented yoga teacher and writer who's based here in Los Angeles and um, has just written a new book actually that you might enjoy. And she's a great blog called Yogi's Anonymous. And from one of her blog posts, How to Live in the Present and Ditch Your Stress, 
she said the ticket off that ride is free, simple and available to you all at all times. And it's called your breath. So again, when in doubt, if you can only remember to breathe from this entire presentation, it'll take you such a long way in being able to de-stress. So I've got some like resources and references for you here and a lot more reading. So be sure to check them out. You'll also get this emailed to you as well. Um, so it's a whole bunch of different articles, anything from some more of scientific and um, statistic oriented kind of reads. One of the ones I think would be really interesting for the group on the call today is how each Myers-Briggs personality type reacts to stress and how to help. Um, I think most companies have some type of program where you have a, you know, a visiting speaker come in and do the Myers-Briggs testing. And so it's, I found it extremely accurate and really interesting. So I highly recommend checking that one out. And then of course the next one down, what not to say to a stressed out colleague. That's probably a good one to visit too. Um, and then some of the resources here, these are all ones that I've referred to throughout the presentation. Um, so be sure to check that out as well. And last but not least, some recommended apps and tech support that you can utilize throughout your workday um, as well. So oops, I'll leave it there and then I can pop it over to Q&A. Awesome. Thank you, Brady. Uh, I, I've been breathing deeply ever since we lost connection, and I have to say it's uh, it's helped. So I want to remind everybody to um, type in your questions using the Q&A chat box at the bottom of your screen. Um, we've left uh, plenty of time to answer anything that you want to know that Brady mentioned uh, today. Um, Brady, I know you and I, while we're waiting for some of those questions come, to come in, I know you and I had a conversation about, you know, a lot of the the things that you've suggested today, while they, you know, don't seem to take a lot of time, people feel like they just don't have time in the moment um, to really practice some of these things. So how do you respond to that? That's a really good question. Um, and I will say, while doing my yoga teacher training, it was really interesting. That was probably the most common thing people said to me of like, well, I don't have time to meditate or I don't have time to do a yoga class. And I think um, in part, people say those kinds of things because the way it's introduced is that it's complicated or hard or requires, you know, exactly an hour, you know, to do something. And so um, on the time thing, I think, again, it's one part reframing your thinking, you know, to take a deep breath takes less than 15 seconds. Um, you know, it can take up to 30 seconds if you want it to, if you've got a really good breath capacity. But that's really no time at all when you look at the 24 hours you have in a day um, setting aside, you know, 15 to 30 seconds for yourself really isn't much. Um, but it's also, I think, about just like when you remember to do the practice to try it. So let's say you get off the call today and, you know, later this evening something stressful happens and you don't remember any of the tools. That's totally fine. It's the idea of like saying, okay, I'm going to set a reminder to like breathe every day at 10 a.m. Just practice that every day taking one breath at 10 a.m. And eventually you'll be able to work up to when you are stressed, remembering to breathe. And so it's kind of the idea that like whatever tool feels good to you, or even if it's drinking more water throughout the day is where you start, um, you know, picking one thing and making that a practice and something intentional, because then when you need it, it will be there. And it'll actually surprise you when you when you know, I remember teaching this one class on communications and one of the girls in the class was saying, uh, was given a similar breathing exercise and she got super upset with someone. And uh, literally she was like, and then all of a sudden five minutes later, I remembered to breathe. And she's like, and I started doing the breathing exercise and I started walking and she's like, and I just kept going. And when I came back to my desk, she said, I looked at the guy and I, and she was able to articulate, you really upset me. That hurt my feelings. And I had to go and deal with that on my own, but I've dealt with it now. And can we like start the conversation over? And what she said was, is she's like, I didn't remember to use it in the moment. I remembered five minutes later. She's like, but the important thing was, is that the tool was there and I used it. And you're like, yes, that's the point. 
That's really interesting because we just got a question from Jonathan that sort of asks that. Jonathan's question is, how do you get others to change their behavior that is causing you and others stress? And I realize, you know, your talk today, Brady, is about how someone can manage their own individual stress. But um, the answer you just gave is sort of a reflection of how do you use these tools to impact others as well? Brady, do we lose you again? Are you still there? Yeah, I'm getting a message that Brady just lost sound. Um, okay, Brady, do you want to try maybe just logging off quickly and logging back in, and and we'll ask people oh, to hang on so I we can get to some of these up. questions. Oh, there you are, perfect. <laughs> so, were you able to hear that question I'm I just back. asked? Sorry, uh, that just Jonathan pause had for a second. In? There we go. <laughs> Great. Yeah, I think I got the gist of it. And well, number one, first and foremost, this is like my everyday practice is remembering that you unfortunately can't control anyone else's behavior. Um, and that I think is the hardest thing to let go of. Like when you truly want what's best for everyone around you, it's like, oh, if like, you know, if only they could do this this way. Um, that's actually extremely stressful to want other people to change their behavior. And I think that I think that was sort of at least like what I caught out of the gist of it as like my sort of hook on that question and let me know if I'm missing the tail end of it. Um, so when you can't change other people's behavior, which is pretty much never, first, it's like first and foremost is just giving up and saying, okay, I can't change other people's behavior and making that your mantra. <laughs> it's like, that's like number one, it's the place to start. Um, and that's like in all practices, whether it's yoga, meditation or whatever, you're like the only thing you can really control is yourself. And at the end, and at the end of the day, it's like you can only control your reaction. And so, how do you deal with difficult people? Oh, I mean, I think that that is a constant practice, and that's like our our yoga as human beings. And by the way, I define yoga as like what happens in the world and off the mat. It's the practice on the mat that allows you to do yoga in the bigger scheme of things. Um, and the, you know, it's finding that peace of mind by saying, you know, you let that person next to you like freak out or do whatever they have to do um, to be themselves. And it's about you staying centered and saying like, this isn't about me. And, and re acknowledging that, um, you know, the only thing you control is your reaction to it. And so it's like detachment becomes the best practice in that. Was there a second part to that question that maybe I missed? No, that was pretty much it. I, I think you nailed it uh, right on the head. You know, it was basically how do you how do you control other people, and that's um, obviously something that uh, isn't really an option in a lot of ways. Um, but we did just get another great question. Unless you're a director, oh, I was going to say unless you're a director in theater, then yes, you can control other <laughs> <Exactly>. people. <laughs> Shannon has a really interesting question um, that I feel like we. We just sort of danced around this a little bit, but how about for people who are working in open work floor plans? So those giant cube farms, do you have any recommendations for people to avoid stress triggers in those types of environments or how they might be able to better manage their own stresses? That's a really good question. And actually they're doing a lot of interesting studies on how um, open work environments are actually terrible for performance and increase stress significantly. So if you wanna email me, I'm happy to send those over to you. Um, okay, a couple things that are, can be really helpful and they sound, they're actually like unfortunately super cheesy, but a lot of offices have found them effective. So number one would be, again, like if you can control you and your environment, um, that can be super helpful. So one way of doing that is wearing headphones. Um, whether or not you're listening to music doesn't necessarily matter. Um, even just having noise canceling headphones on is extremely helpful for just cutting down on the noise and the distractions. Um, another thing that can be really useful is, um, so there's like two forms of distractions now in the workplace. One is like just being in an open room with people walking around and doing things, you know, that's like one form of it. And the other form is on your actual computer, whether um, you're using some kind of chat forum like, for instance, Skype or some kind of internal mechanism, whether it be through like Facebook or iChat 
or whatever, getting pings and notices on your computer is another way of getting really distracted, um, whether you're in an open workspace or not. So setting off those little um, alerts, you know, the alert that you've got a new email, the alert that you have a new message um, during different periods of the day and blocking that out in your calendar so that other coworkers know that you're not available, that's super helpful. And you can also put a sign on your desk. Oh, a lot of companies are doing this where they have like different color codes, like red means stop, like I'm working on something, green means go, yellow means I'm working on something, but I can be interrupted. Um, and having different signage then will allow people to know that like now's not the right time to walk up to you. Because I do think there's a, there's a lack of boundaries in an open workplace. It sort of feels like everyone's available all the time, which just isn't true. And so that's like one thing that people have found really helpful. Also, if you have the opportunity to like book a conference room and you can take a laptop in there and do work when you need quiet time, that can be really helpful as well. Um, but yeah, I do think it's definitely having a conversation with your larger team and saying what would be most useful for us as a team and ideating together. It's actually surprising how many good ideas people have um, because you're all working in the same environment together and chances are you're not the only one feeling stressed out by that. Uh, Nora has written an interesting question that actually is impacting my family as well. Nora is wondering how, what tips you might have for people to manage stress that's in direct result of, you know, being in chronic pain. Um, you know, Brady, I realize you're not a doctor. I realize you don't work in a pain clinic, but um, are your answers to some of these questions any different for, you know, physical pain that somebody's dealing with or living with? So chronic pain is, I'm actually coming out of a year of really intense chronic pain. Um, and and I, I can totally relate to that on a personal level of what that feels like and what that is. I had a shoulder injury um, that took a really long time to heal. And it was like, it's excruciating to be in constant pain. Um, and I actually do have some interesting research on that if you want to reach out to me directly that I can share with you because, again, I'm not a doctor um, and I am lucky to have a lot of really great practitioners in my life who have helped me on the physical side of releasing stress. But I personally believe that a lot of my physical stress or a lot of my physical pain was caused by my mental stress and the way I chose to absorb my stress and pile it on, you know, going back to that leak in the roof metaphor. Um, you know, I had a lot of accumulation of stress in my body and I think that's how it chose to manifest itself. And the, the hard thing is about chronic stress is it becomes a really vicious cycle. Uh, or I mean, the, the chronic pain part of stress um, because the pain itself is stressful and the stress creates more pain. And so how do you get out of that cycle? Um, I, I was watching, some, it was like a news post um, a, about physical therapy for people with chronic pain and how floating in water allowed them to experience weightlessness and serenity in their body and how just floating in a pool of water allowed them to have um, physical ease that they couldn't experience experience on dry land. And, and I was like, wow, how can someone achieve like that feeling of weightlessness anytime, anywhere? And certainly breathing is a big part of that. Um, and it's something that has been really helpful for me. And also meditation, like being able to transcend and get outside the confines of my mind in my body um, has been really helpful. But and I would also recommend when it comes to chronic pain, um, sometimes therapy can be really helpful as well. Um, there's a lot of research shows that in working through some of the like mental blocks that you have towards your body and stress um, can be really helpful in relieving that. And then the, you know, the last one would be like floating, just floating in water. Like if you find water relaxing or beautiful or floating in a hammock or something that just allows you to feel a sense of weightlessness can actually be really helpful in relieving mental strain according to these studies that they're doing now, um, which I think is so simple and yet so fascinating. Um, but I'm, I'm sorry to hear about the chronic pain. Also, if you're sitting in a desk, um, 
chair throughout the day, that can cause a lot of physical uncomfort, I guess, or discomfort is the word I'm looking for. Um, a lot of desk chairs are actually designed for quote unquote average sized human beings, but most companies order jet desk chairs that are fitted for men and not for women. Um, so changing things like your desk chair to make it more supportive, making sure you have like good pillows on your bed at night um, so that your neck is able to rest, um, things like that can also make a really big difference. Or if you spend a lot of time in your car, making sure that your driver's seat is also really comfortable and equipped with the right lumbar support and other things. Brady, we're running up against the hour here. Um, we do have some remaining questions, but what I'm, from what I'm reading, they're really specific for people's individual industries and experiences. And I think, okay. uh, so people like Tom, uh, who've written in questions, I, I'm going to encourage you to just take a look at Brady's framework again. And then, Brady, you've obviously listed your email address on the screen in front of everybody. Is that the best way yeah. for people to follow up with you if they, if they really have a burning question? That's a great way for people to follow up. So my email is bradyhahn at mac.com. So it's B-R-A-D-Y-H-A-H-N at mac, M-A-C dot com. Um, and so, yeah, I'm happy to take personal questions and do my best to answer them or at least refer you to resources that might be helpful. Um, I am actually also able to offer, if you're interested, of complimentary 30 minute meditation if you want to do one over the phone. Um, I actually run a series called Sit Within, um, which is a group meditation class that I do here in Los Angeles. It's been um, a women's only group for the last six months. And so I would like to open that up to more people as well. So if you're in the LA area, you can go to my website and under offerings, um, see like upcoming events, more will be coming up later this month. Um, but of course, if you're out of LA, then I'm, like I said, I'm more than happy to do a complimentary 30 minute call and help you design a really simple meditation um, for your work and lifestyle. And for everyone on the call today, I'm also offering a discounted rate. So I have a workshop that I've just made kind of a digital workshop. Um, and so one is the three part meditation course. And also um, a course that I call Leading From Within, which is a toolkit around um, how to facilitate and manage teams um, in a mindful way. And so both of those are on sale right now. You can save $50 if you're interested in signing up for that today. And again, that's available on my website under offerings and you go down to workshop. I'm really glad that you mentioned that, Brady. I wanted to make sure we, we put a plug in for some of the things that you're doing, because obviously uh, our guests may or may not know, but you've volunteered your time and expertise today. So on behalf of the uh, BU Alumni Association, I really want to thank you for the time that you've given to members of our community. I think you presented some really great um, and really small action items, some really manageable things that people can do for all the stresses that we all run into every day. So thank you again. Thank you for having me. I have to say my time at BU is still provided me some of my fondest memories and um, was a huge catalyst for me in stepping into my life as a professional person. So it's great to be back and to offer something back to our community. Well, that's great to hear. Thank you for saying that. I also want to thank all of our guests for participating today. Specifically want to thank all of the, those of you who have donated to BU in the past. We literally couldn't put on programs like this without your support, so thank you. Uh, we have an incredible lineup of webinars coming up in the next few months, starting next week with a fully baked idea, The Accidental Entrepreneurs, a great tale of career reinvention that we're going to be hosting on September 15th. You can view the schedule of upcoming webinars and register for them now on our website at bu.edu slash alumni. And as always, if you or any BU alum you know would be interested in presenting a professional development webinar or have a topic that you'd like to showcase for the BU Alumni Association, please feel free to contact me at the Alumni Relations Office or by email at jtmurphy at bu.edu. Thank you everybody for your time. Have a great day or a great evening wherever you might be.